So um, it's about time to move onward to the next piece of this. Um, and uh, question four, part C. Let's see, what did, uh, what did those of us who had to write something up about this before we knew who was going to be here say? We, we're looking at uh, should Arctic research priorities be guided by national policy goals or to be independent of them? And I think that uh, gets into this question that we keep coming to over and over again about whether there's an either and, a both or to pure research versus national and local policies. And it also gets to the question of whether the national policies we're talking about are those of the United States or those of other countries. So I wanted to just throw out a, uh, not a quite hypothetical, something that actually comes from my own research because I've been typing and of course, you know, I, lovely to say one, to, one thing or the other. But if I, like many of us here, were to propose a research project, I'm an archeologist for those of you who hadn't realized that. I don't have quite as much mud on my hands as I normally would like to. Um, I work in Iceland. I've also been, had a really strong interest in working in Greenland for a number of times. Of course, I'm pitching this to, uh, to Christian here um, <laughs> and Elena as well. But um, if I were to choose, if I were to come to Anna and I were to talk to, you, to people at NSF thinking about the work that I want to do, my research questions are very specific and focused. And I'm sure that the sites that I would choose if I weren't thinking otherwise that I wanted to excavate would be ones that really focus directly in on the research questions that I had. And I know from sitting on panels that to some degree if they didn't, and I couldn't make the argument that this is the right place to be, I might not get the funding. On the other hand, if I were to go back to one of the sites in Iceland that I really want to go back and look at because I excavated there in the late 80s, because I excavated there and I showed how important the site is, it's now a nationally protected listed site, and I probably would not be able to dig there because of local policy, which is national policy about heritage. And if I were to come to someplace like Greenland or to Iceland, my interests in looking at those things from the outside might well have nothing to do with local policy, national policy, or priorities about the kind of work that really needs to be done, the sites that need to be excavated. Translate that into your own discipline and how we then put those together. So I guess, Christian, at some level, um, let's just uh, have, I'd like to ask you to bring in some idea, and maybe Lena as well, because if I were to come in with a half million dollar grant to Iceland, or let's say a group of us came in and, and $10 million gets poured into looking either at Inuit sites in Greenland, or into Norse sites in Greenland, it also changes the balance of what kind of work can be done and whose national narratives or, or cultural narratives are being told. And that's something that, as we think, I think a little bit about what, how we advise foreign, how we advise NSF or we think about general issues of how we advance in the next 10 or 20 years. Those decisions have implications beyond our local interests and, and thinking about your policies, national policies, EMBLA, yours, Yarko, what you see in your areas, those of you who are in Alaska, those working in local communities, I think it's important also for us to think about that. So, Christian, I, I hate to put you on the spot, but, uh, but how could I go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I always do, and I, I said yes to this project. <laughs> Let's stay optimistic and talk about how many ways you can do it right instead. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> so, uh, well, first of all, I have uh, just a bit of comment on, on what we talked uh, before the break. In uh, our situation is uh, fairly similar to Iceland. I think we are we are a very small place. We have our own government, and I think the government is working fairly directly with us. We are, in a sense, consultants, at least from. Uh, the National Museum of Greenland. We are consult consultants to the Ministry of Culture. So we have direct interaction with them, which means we are directly affecting policy making in Greenland, in a government that is working for Greenland. That is at least uh, the way it, we hope it's uh, working, and I think it is to a large degree. But it also means that we are, in effect, responsible, and not only should we do 
uh, good re research, all of us, of course, we all know that. That's not really the, the thing is that we are also responsible for informing the policymakers not only um, about our own research, but we need, because it's such a direct relation, we need to sort of also inform them about all the voices in, in research. So not only our own, but also maybe conflicting research, and we need to present it in a way that they can use because they also have tight schedules. So we need to make it, like you say, the same as the, the DC politicians. They don't have time or interest in reading. So we need to present this. And this is where we need sometimes help because so more than, I would say, 98% of research in Greenland is from the outside. Outside funding, outside researchers coming in. And then we read your papers in the, in the journals, and then we have to compress it so the politicians understand. So there's, there's a lot of levels and it takes a long time for us. But we have a chance to have a very direct contact with policymakers. And that's, of course, is not that's an advantage. It's an opportunity for, for helping them. So we try to supply them with the best tools for making the decision, the most nuanced picture of where we are now. But even the, the, the research that's been coming out of the, our NSF funded research the last 10 years about the North is going directly into um, tourist industry and uh, the whole way um, we build heritage management. So you have a very direct effect through NSF funding that you can have. But as we are a small country and we have limited funding for ourselves, it's also so important, or at least it's, it's not your responsibility, but NSF have a really, really, really big chance to make a huge contribution to the Greenlandic society in doing some of what Lena said yesterday. So you can go in and start with the native communities. So, so what what do, do they want to research? And we are trying, uh, we are working towards the same process in the heritage management. So we know that sites are disappearing all over Greenland, but who are we to decide what to save and not to save? It's the people living there, we think, should at least have a strong voice in deciding what, are we, what should we excavate, what should we investigate? And we can do this in all areas of research and really make an impact mm. um, because it's, it's a small community and it's easy to get to the right people and, and Greenlanders are very open and very interested as long as you go out and talk to them and meet them on the ground. Then you get all the interesting information. So there's, I guess, there's so many possibilities to work here. Bring in students from Greenland and so you have to sometimes forget that these are they do not have to be um, geologists, glaciologists, archaeologists, th as long as they sort of get a surface of in contact with this environment of research, you inspire a lot of new people to engage in this. So being more open and engaging more uh, uh, students, basically, on several levels, from like mm -hmm. kids and all the way up to a new university, mm -hmm. a lot of opportunities there, I think. So, well, basically, I see uh, a lot of maybe, well, there's a lot of opportunities that we haven't really explored of, or really used yet that could be used even better. You know, it's, it's going on, and there's, of course, great work being done, but we could do even more fun uh, jobs together here, fun research that incorporates all of these ideas. It's uh, thanks, Christian. Um, I had, I was wondering, I mean, Am I speaking properly? Yeah, OK. Um, from your perspective, I mean, it sounds very positive. Um, would you say that it's felt that way everywhere, that everywhere, um, or that there's differences sort of in how people feel about foreign researchers coming in? Um, or would you say that there's also um, some people are feeling a bit that it's a little colonial or that it's you know not welcome? Because sometimes you do get the sense that you know, we come in with these big grants and maybe, you know, maybe we are mm. walking around with our big boots on, you know? Um, I mean, I, I, I hear you. you, you sound very positive, but is everybody, does everybody feel that way? Uh, short answer, no. <laughs> 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 uh, that, and that is because we, uh, the, well, there's a long history of, of this foreign research colonial research, research from Denmark is also still a very huge player there. And it has been the same way, you, like, like Lena, was, Lena was talking about, was you have people jumping in with a very cool equipment, nice looking jackets, all <laughs> like flying in with helicopters. They spend a few days and they fly out and people go, what the 
hell happened? And I think the sentiment in many places I've talked to people is that they're, they're kind of getting fed up with this approach. So, but the minute you start engaging these people, you will get a positive response, I think. Mm. But if you don't, there's going to be some negative because it is a very colonial, imperialistic way of, of doing this. Mm. So, yeah, Anna and then Gerald. I mean, in how many, I mean, do you have a sense of, because NSF funds a fair amount of research in Greenland, um, and we do have some nice, or what seemingly the joint, um, the JSEP, the Joint Arctic Science Program uh, that works with Greenlandic students, uh, American students, and Danish students, uh, but that's just a few students. In general, is there a per, a percentage like are are people happy? What's a good model? Are people happy with uh, the research that's being funded and the engagement that's occurring, or is there a general sense of unease with uh, the research that's going on and there's not enough uh, engagement with the public? Mm. Um, I know. From my own experience, that uh, because of language barriers in Greenland, most people speak Greenlandic and Danish, and then English is the third language. Uh, and if the words are not translated correctly in, uh, uh, to be understood by the Greenlandic people, then the interest won't even be uh, waking up. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have seen that the uh, uh, scientists are flying into Kangasluswak and then they go up on top of uh, the ice cap and uh, do their samplings uh, in the uh, in the nearby area of Kangasluswak in uh, with plants and uh, lakes and nobody never he hears about those guys. Uh, but uh, through my work, former work uh, with ICC, uh, for instance, we were uh, approached by a university here in uh, the U.S. asking us di directly, what can we do better? Uh, we have been uh, working on the ice cap, but they want to uh, disseminate our results to the Greenlandic people. How do we do that? So we have been counseling for a sort of project, and uh, uh, the students who went to the ice cap and uh, to do samples in the lakes uh, are now traveling to the uh, co uh, towns around the coast. And uh, they are working with the high schools, uh, giving public uh, presentations of their results, and uh, I think that this is the way to do things. Also because uh, I think that uh, the brains that everyone has here is an, a resource that we need in Greenland, because we are so few, and we don't have a huge uh, research institutions that can uh, be deal dealing with all these different uh, uh, research uh, fields. Uh, and you can help in a, a, a filling the holes uh, within the Greenlandic uh, society. Yeah. and. I know that uh, we are welcoming, uh, welcoming people, and uh, if uh, we can do it together, uh, I think that uh, there would be a more welcome uh, uh, mentality rather than a, a negative. Mm. So. Well, Anna, just one question for you. Uh, in discussions we were having out there in the uh, sort of gray warmth um, among the bamboo, the Arctic bamboo that we planted for this group, um, 
One of the questions that came up uh, when Lena and I were talking was, uh, and again, getting back to the idea of co-production, to some degree funding is, is needed at some level, sometimes smaller funding, um, to be able to get into the field to communicate and collaborate in the pre-proposal stage to talk uh, with these communities. And, and it could be in Iceland, it could be in anywhere, it could be in a, in a Tlingit community as well to be able to know that that collaboration has been done, especially when the local culture is such that email and faxes and all that sort of thing, text messaging may work, but actually sitting down and having the one-on-one -on -one conversation is critical. Um, Eagers and Rapids may be one vehicle for that, but uh, I don't know if everyone uses them that way or, wh or how, whether, whether there are possibilities that we think about new pieces of funding that allow those pre-proposals? Is that something that happens in any NSF directorates? Um, I can't really speak to the other NSF directorates. I suspect possibly not. Okay. Um, we can but be unique. In the Arctic Social Science Program, absolutely. And I've used the eager mechanism, and maybe Simon uh, would like to, to, to say something, and he's allowed me to do that. I've used it as saying it doesn't make any sense for me to fund your research at to the tune of three hundred thousand dollars, if when you get to the community they say no, <laughs> so better I fund you for twenty five, thirty, forty thousand, mm. so you can go to the community mm. and get those permissions and get that interest and mm. find out what they're also interested in, um, and then come back and say, here's what we've done, here's what we know, and mm. sometimes um, panels recommend that you know, wow, a really cool yeah. idea. Uh, but you really need to to run this by the communities that you are interested in working in. And um, without that, we can't fund you. Why don't you give them a pilot to okay. do that? So, yeah, you can. Yeah. Uh, you can do that. That's, okay. I guess, the simplest answer. Sure, yes, you, you can in Arctic social science. I, I think Gerald had his hand up, and then Chris, and then Yarko. Hold on. We need to get you a mic. Otherwise, we can't. No one will know what you said. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Anna made some very important points about early career scholars and what we can learn from them. I want to make three quick points from a very old, old career scholar. My first work in Baffin Island was in 1960. Mm. That's 57 years ago. <laughs> uh, and uh, from this perspective, I want to say, this stuff about policy strikes me as pure damn fantasy, just fantasy. The only influence I have seen of any positive effect on policy has come from either the lawyers or protest movements. And the only research I or anyone I know that has ever done that has really ever affected policy is the historical research we've done for lawyers who are suing those SOBs in government for what they've done wrong to Native people. And so I want to emphasize that if you want to, or organizing protest movements, which also affect policy. So I want to emphasize if you want to have an effect on policy, you'd work with lawyers period. You don't go around trying to be nice to government officials, because even though many of them as human beings are wonderfully nice, lovely people, the general situation is an antagonism between government and Native people. Point one. <laughs> point, two, point two, if you go to a community like Nain, uh, where several of us have worked, uh, it's an Inuit community in Northern the lower end of northern Labrador, you will see an extraordinarily beautiful, expensive, massive government building and slum housing that the local people themselves built or organized the building of for the relocatees from Hebron. The relocatees from the, a community called Hebron that was closed have moved into what was built as and maintained as slum housing in the community of Nain. In my 57 years of work, the biggest thing I've seen in Native communities is a massive increase in inequality. 50 years ago, they were all poor, they were all squeezed, they were all suffering. Now some are vastly not poor and not suffering, and some are. And any influence we might have on policy 
comes in a context of native sovereignty that has to be recognized not just as, oh, you're going to give us permission for your research, but we have to work with and against native elites to address the situation of their own people. The third thing I want to say is that the three major sources of international flows of currency are arms, oil, and tourism. And so, and tourism is a massive industry. Huh? It's the third major source of the international movement of currency. These cultural, quote unquote, uh, ministers who want us to use to develop the kinds of images of the past that attract tourists. Those images, in my own words, those images are largely bullshit. The native people live simultaneously within and against their own history. They live necessarily within a history that's not quite past and against a history of colonialism, of oppression, et cetera, et cetera. You all know that. I'm not telling you anything new. What we need to do as historical anthropologists, as archaeologists, as help them develop livable connections to their own continuing history. And the kind of work that cultural ministries want us to do is not helpful. OK, good, all good points. I think we were focused a little bit more, though, potentially on working within the, within the national policies of those communities. Chris, I saw you had your hand up, and I'm not sure if it was related to that. And Yarko, you probably have some things to say about oh, tourism. Yeah. Uh, I, I do, as somebody who works internationally, I work in Canada. There are, I mean, it depends on if you're looking at national policy, maybe some of what he's saying is correct. I think there's obviously ways we can influence more local policy, and I do that through national, uh, the Newfoundland Labrador Archaeological Society, other w ways to gain access to some of these higher echelons of power, and those have had effects in terms of how we think about heritage and, and things. So I don't, I'm not quite as pessimistic. I think there are definitely, when you get to higher levels, it is more difficult and lawyers need to be involved. And there are actually lawyers involved at these lower levels too. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I take your point, but that wasn't the point I was actually originally wanting to, to make. I wanted to ask, ask Anna, and in, in terms of Lena's comment too, it, and it's just basically out of my own ignorance, in terms of how we communicate what we do in places where we go to, to work with other national entities or groups, uh, sovereign entities, uh, is, does the NSF fund things like um, intensive language learning so that we can better communicate those kinds of things, so we can make those barriers more directly uh, in terms of how we interact with these international groups so we can communicate our better? I think we can. <laughs> I love short You're answers, that's great. Making your, I mean, put it in your research grant, it can be part of broader impacts. You are making yourself better at, I, um, I can't imagine that in three years one could learn Kalashisut <laughs> well enough to be able to communicate their research. I'm not sure I can communicate broad swaths of my research in Russian. So, um, but I would, I can't imagine uh, reviewers not thinking that was a really great idea and it can certainly make you better at, uh, at working with a translator. Even if you're not able to speak the language yourself, it makes you better at working with a translator. Yeah. Hmm. I think, Yarko, you had your hand up at one point, didn't you? Or, 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 or am I making that up? No, you, you don't, but I, it's a bit long that I was raising it. So, But getting back, as you mentioned, the, the tourism aspect, I've, I've done a, well, historically work with Sami and, and, and how they have been used and, and, and depicted or represented in, in, in tourism. And, and clearly, of course, there is a you know, colonial history is evident there. The, the, uh, local people are, are described as a bit, you know, living in a, still in the past. But I mean, that's, that's about tourism. There's nothing real or authentic, authentic in tourism. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, <laughs> in, in, uh, from 1960s, uh, the tourism and authenticity has been discussed. 
I mean, uh, Burstin did a book on, on Seuda events in America. And, 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 and since that, there has been this discussion. Uh, tourism is, is made up in, in, in that, that sense. And, and, and if, you, if you think about, for example, indigenous craft, uh, you may do a lot of codes of conduct that what makes it authentic indigenous craft. But uh, can you name any indigenous group that has a tradition to sell souvenirs <laughs> to the local people? So is, 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 it, is it how authentic that, that is? Or is it, is it an indigenous culture or is it more you know, response to touristic culture? Yeah. But that's another other thing. My, my point was actually to, uh, to, to refer back to Kevin's and, and Michel's follow-up on, on when you come from yeah. the outside uh, to, to another other policy or academic context, we talk about a lot, of, a lot about community. And I think that that's a good thing, community. Yep. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think that if you come from outside box uh, to a different policy environment, I think it's a good to get diverse views to, to that, that discussion you know, in a political or policy level. Uh, and uh, same, same applies to academic uh, field. But, uh, but on the other hand, these remote peripheral places has a lo have a long history on, on, on being uh, driven by non-local research agen agendas. Yeah. So we need to be careful with, with that aspect, especially as nowadays these peripheral areas do have researchers. They have research units. They have universities, mm. colleges. They mm. have people who work with, with the same kind of issues. That may not have been the case in 1950s, 60s, or so on. But nowadays, that, that's the case. And, and I know that some colleagues do feel that, that they should somehow be engaged with, with yeah. then those. Uh, it doesn't mean that we need to include local scholars' names to our papers, but that we would collaborate some, somehow uh, with, with and acknowledge the work that has already been done there by, by, those, uh, by, the, by the local, local colleagues. So there are different kind of communities. We are also community, academic community, and we should respect that academic community that may exist there in, in uh, northern Norway uh, or Nuuk uh, in, in Greenland and, and, and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think that, yeah, that, that was my point to, to think that, uh, that, that not only think community as a, as a, as a, as a residence, but also as scholars in, mm. in, in those when we go to Iceland or and and I think it gets it gets nicely to the point made several times already that that we can't think of any of these communities as homogeneous entities, but as places that have a lot of divergent voices. And knowing the landscape culturally and academically is important. I think uh, I saw Simon. I saw you. So uh, just to take a shot at the question: um, Should Arctic research priorities be guided by national? policy goals. Well, I'm a federal official, so <laughs> my answer is yes. Uh, but I think the research can also shape those same policies, so it's a bit of give and take. Um, so as Mark uh, mentioned on uh, in his uh, talk on Tuesday, IOPIC is creating a, a new five-year plan. So IOPIC is an interagency, so it's federal agencies, interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. Um, and that policy is, uh, was in, in the legislation that, well, actually the policy wasn't, the, the creation of a policy was in the legislation that created this uh, body uh, in 1984. Um, and, and we sort of haven't really dealt with that policy uh, piece in our discussions the last 30 years, but we're, we're sort of coming back to what was intended. And this next plan will be sort of guided by uh, policy drivers. We're not calling it policy right now, we're calling it policy drivers. And uh, they're draft and they're actually available on the IOPIC collaborations website. And so the first one is enhance the well being of Arctic residents. Um, the second is advanced stewardship of the Arctic environment. The third is strengthen national and regional security. And the fourth is improve understanding of the Arctic as a component of planet Earth or uh, the, the Earth system. So we're, we're doing actually quite well on all the areas uh, except 
uh, enhance the well-being of Arctic residents. Um, the health community is sort of all over that. They're really, they have been in the game, they continue to be in the game, uh, but I can't help but think that the social scientists have something to offer in this space. Um, it's, and, and that's sort of my sort of, uh, request of, uh, it wasn't the intention of the set of workshops, but it could, the workshops could very well con contribute to informing uh, what we can do. Uh, so the idea is that we, we use those drivers to produce a five-year plan. If we miss the plan, so it'll be done by the end of this administration, um, it's okay because we can keep working along these lines. We can keep on having conversations that will uh, that will, sh will shape things that we say we're going to do as as a federal investment, um, mm. and this is taxpayers' money. So we think it actually we would like to do good when we spend the taxpayers' money. Uh, despite your view of federal officials. Uh, we would prefer to do it before we get sued to do it. Uh, <laughs> we'd prefer to do it as part of our plan. Uh, and I think we can. And, and sort of an example of that is, you know, so this is, this conversation that I've been in in the last you know, day and a half is, you know, this is really the first time I've heard uh, quite a lot of the research uh, framed around trauma Mm. you know, individual trauma and community trauma. Mm. Um, and that's sort of, that has not been in the, the policy discussions. It just simply isn't there. Uh, you know, the, the, the U.S. has a, a national Arctic policy. Let me just pull it up here. Um, and there are certain things in it that you might expect, like uh, economic development. Uh, is in there. National security is, of course, in there. So is, I'll read it, uh, improve the Arctic indigenous community, sorry, involve the Arctic indigenous community in decisions that affect them. Uh, so that's part of the national policy. Uh, maybe not a lot of people know that. Um, and, I, and I will say this, that, that, that it's been, from a political level, from a administrative level, uh, this particular single sentence in the policy is probably uh, there was less follow through than in all of the ele other elements of the of the policy uh, and I think again the social science community can perhaps help uh, inform the federal officials on how to, to do this better uh, although again the conversations that we've had about engagement uh, they are actually reflect very much what the federal officials are finding. It would mean over engagement, under engagement, mm. communicating, listening, all of those things that we've talked about mm -hmm. are very much sort of in, in play as we think about that issue. Scientific uh, monitoring and research is also in the national policy. So the, the, the business of doing science. And so there's, there's going to be a balance between science that is um, driving towards doing good and just the bottom-up research. So the U.S. feels very strongly that uh, sort of a, there is a home for just basic research and you know, NSF is an agency that feels that very much. Um, so not everything, not everything has to be sort of tied back to uh, some policy goal that you find on the web somewhere. Um, but uh, I'd like to think that this community, the social science community, can uh, inform. It's not just about data, which Igor mentioned. It's really about knowledge, producing knowledge that people can understand and say, wow, okay, now I understand. Now I understand. So Simon now understands that sort of trauma is a framing issue mm -hmm. that we can sort of work towards, but we need your help to, to, to frame that in, 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 a, in a way that people can understand, and people can understand it in order to make a difference. And Gerald sort of hinted at that, but it would be really good to, to know how you would frame the research and the knowledge that that research produces yeah. in order to, to make a difference in a positive way. Great.
I'm, uh, I'm aware of the fact that we're supposed to be moving on to question five here in the near future. And uh, I think, you know, that is the future of Arctic social sciences, and that's a great segue. I'm also, uh, you know, I think as we think about, and obviously I hope that the discussions will continue online and other ways with us as we think about these things. But one of the questions that may be of concern as we think about policy versus direct, you know, uh, pure science, if, if there is anything as pure as pure science, um, are these timelines, when we talk about five-year plans, four-year administrations, three-year research grants, and I think about, for example, Susan, your example, or Doug Anderson's example, where it's taken a lifetime of commitment to a community to be able to work through starting with pure research questions until that, and even in Western Iceland where I've worked, um, it takes, a, you know, it takes at least 10, 15, 20 years of working with and coming back to that community and giving things back before you really begin to see enough trust and also the interest in saying, how can you help us? And for me to understand, or any of us to understand, why the commitments we can make after that amount of time are really known. So, Embla, I saw you had your hand up, and then let's uh, try to move into the future of Arctic social science a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, I just wanted, because you were talking about the policy itself, um, I imagine that most people have read Arctic country CIS policies in general, uh, the European Union draft policy on the Arctic, etc. Um, if we're discussing the importance of social scientists and we're discussing the importance of uh, interdisciplinary research with, uh, with between social scientists and natural scientists, then perhaps if we go through all these documents and compare them, what we find is uh, is a number of contradictions, the largest of which is possibly how each and every state is going to protect the environment, uh, make sure that the region uh, is sustainably developed, but at the same time going to increase uh, shipping traffic, um, extract oil, extract <laughs> minerals, um, follow the fish wherever it goes and extract the fish, and do all these uh, different extractive, um, engage in all these ex different extractive industries. So as far as I can see, uh, trying to figure out how you're going to develop these two vastly different paths, how you're going to reconcile these vastly different paths, uh, takes a, a whole bunch of expertise, or I don't really like the word expert, but knowledgeable people. Um, what I think is really important about the community work that's being, um, that is being produced, I mean, the knowledge that's being produced, is that that is almost the only effort being made in trying to figure out what does it take for us to define what is sustainable in local contexts. It's the only, it's the only, it's the only information being pr produced. Because if you also read these documents very critically, you will, you will find that there's, there's always a mention of involvement of indigenous peoples groups. Um, some of them include the, the concept of local communities. The environment is always going to be protected. Um, the fragile in Arctic in environment is always going to be protected somehow. <laughs> Do not ask me how. Um, and what was the third one? There was the, the co cooperation. Um, oh, there's a bunch of other contradictions. But uh, in the end, you kind of get the feeling that um, these passages that generally don't get a lot of space within these policies, um, <coughs> they are public relations text they are put in there to appease the public, to appease the voices that are requiring such uh, inclusion. Um, I just wanted to get that across, because this is a problem I think that the region as a whole is facing. Mm -hmm. So any kind, of, any kind of research or knowledge produced or methods produced to increase the quality of research uh, whether it's done in Alaska or Iceland or Greenland, it doesn't really matter because this is transferable knowledge and it's all very important 
uh, for policymakers that this comes from different directions. So it's not just a voice from Alaska. It's not just a voice from from uh, from Greenland. And this is something that local communities in general and the region in general can learn from indigenous peoples groups. Is the way that uh, is the way they cooperate through a network of groups mm -hmm. and have managed to create a a very strong voice in the Arctic, uh, mm. so that everyone knows what indigenous peoples. Although it's the same as you were saying before, Kevin, that this is not a monolithic, you know, mm. entity. I mean, mm. there's like loads of different conflicts in indigenous communities as well, in local communities in Iceland. You're not going to find, you're not going to find the person that can tell you all about the community. Um, and now I'm rambling again, so I'm going <laughs> to stop. I'm just okay. saying no. uh, we have to make sure that the information is there so that, that these sort of PR passages in policy papers uh, can be pushed, so people can be pushed into doing something about them, you know, putting your money where your mouth is type of thing. Thank you for that, Embla. I, I, that's like the perfect segue into, I think, the future of Arctic social sciences or what we can do. Also, I, I'm glad that at least one person read the policy statements that, that, were, that were sent out there, the national policy statements, because I think that's part of the reason why I did put them in there is because they are, on the surface of it, so much about collaboration and cooperation. And, and it is like rubber stamped sort of boilerplate that's put in there. And it's when you drill down to the details where there are details, and I think they're intentionally left with very few details until you get actually into implementation strategies that you begin to wonder uh, how do these things fit. And we're, we're operating within those realms and the idea that we may have some role in at least pushing local communities or gaining information from local communities to, um, you know, to create some structure underneath that or at least a bottom up. That's at least one interesting perspective of where we could go. So who, so let's think about the future of Arctic social sciences. The uh, questions there, we don't have a lot of time, but we can also, break for lunch. We've got an hour afterwards. If we want to continue this, I have nothing much for that hour except I want you to write, fill out some evaluations for us to say what did we do wrong and what did we do right. We can continue this conversation. It's critical, I think, for Arctic Horizons and, and others to think about what, as a group of us who are different from every other group, what do we think are these key questions that remain unanswered regarding the ways we integrate social and uh, ecological systems in the Arctic, what are we unable to do as a result of current knowledge gaps, what does this matter, and what can we, uh, what do we risk if we're not open to new and emerging issues, and where can we make a difference? That isn't on there, but that should be probably the only one. What, what can we do uh, that will make a difference down the line? Yeah, Amy. <clears throat> so this is in answer to your question, but it goes back to something Yarko said, and that is that um, when we do think about um, the future and, and asking communities and uh, institutions as well and organizations, right, what their research needs are. I think one of the most important things we don't want to do, though, is forget the past. In other words, because the Arctic has been researched um, so long, there are lots and lots of uh, research and policy documents and um, community-created um, uh, documents and things, you know, that are on shelves, they haven't ever been digitized, mm. they, in other words, I just want to say that as we think about the future, we don't want to reinvent the wheel because, you know, nobody likes folks to come and say, well, we're going to study this, and they said, well, we just did that 10 years ago, and that went nowhere. So I, I, all I want to say is that I think one of the things in terms of thinking through um, how we uh, ask these key unanswered questions is mm. not forget that there may actually be, have been um, way under the radar, people working, especially at that local scale, on some of these questions before. And if you can get to some of that first, that can really help think about, even if you're going to ask the same question, how to ask it based on mm. um, a level of work that's already happened. And I just wanted to point that out. Is, is there an implementation policy behind, or piece behind that about the ways in which we might want to be thinking as we look to the future about how do we capture those earlier ideas and ask bring them people. together? So it, it also refers to this idea of ask, of, of being able to go and 
um, look at a uh, either look at a place in terms of geography or look at an issue first before writing your big major research proposal. So for example, our work um, you know, is a participatory scenarios work and it's on healthy sustainable communities and of course healthy sustainable communities have been an issue in, Ar in the Arctic, mm -hmm. Arctic Alaska for hundreds of, you know, well, mm. you know, recently in research, right, 50 years. Mm. So we had to do a lot of phone calling and a lot of archive looking to find, uh, you know, who had done this sort of work, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, what conclusions had they reached, because we didn't want to write a grant that would then say, oh, you've never thought about being a healthy, sustainable community, yep. right? We, so, which obviously people have. Mm. So that's all I mean is that I think you know, our, our key unanswered questions are also part of this notion of continuity in, in local scale areas that we've been talking about and, you know, do your homework and think about how others may have thought about this too. Mm -hmm. That's all I want to point mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think that's a really important point, and I just wanted to add a little concrete example to that of something when there has been previous research at the local level. I think one of the frustrations that I've seen run across in different organizations is not having the funding or the um, reach to apply. You know, we've found research on certain needs and really have don't have the staffing or something to go with that. So I think instead of trying to produce a new study on needs, sometimes one way that um, it's possible to contribute is by maybe teaming up with a community organization to help with writing a grant application um, based on some previous research for, you know, direct services or funding that is not research based. So I think that's one of those ways that you can use those previous results to try and do community engagement that is meaningful for the needs that are already identified, even if it's not technically part of your own research project. Yeah, Susan. So this isn't, um, some of this is follow-up um, of what's just been said, but also um, I think first to get, um, in terms of the future, uh, we have mentioned archives and mining archives is important. I also think it's important to realize that the work that all of us are doing needs that, that a lot of the data we're collecting that, uh, you know, understanding the, the uh, confidential nature of some of it, but that we all need to think about what archive our work is going, our data are going to land in. And I think it's something that when you think of the hard sciences, you know, there are, is data repository requirements. And I think we really need to as individuals be thinking about that component of, you know, where are your papers going to go so that other scientists will have access to them. Um, the other one is in terms of looking to the future, uh, Peter and I were having a conversation this morning about um, where do we send our students to get PhDs in Arctic social science in the United States. Where can we send them? And I think that um, we can send them to some good universities where a lot of times I know my students end up in South America or wherever because there is not an Arctic social scientist at that university. And so I think that as we are thinking about our future, we also have to be thinking about where are the future social scientists going to come from. Mm. And that, to my mind, links back into the question we had yesterday of the contributions of Arctic social science to the social sciences. Mm. And if we do not increase our visibility in the social sciences, then universities that are replacing or getting new lines are not going to consider the Arctic a relevant area to cover. So I think this is something that we really have to 
pay attention to and consider seriously. Yeah, good. Um, take one more question, and then I want to sort of do a little bit of a, I want to sort of refocus this away from what do we need to do to get our, to get our acts together to more of the questions of what it is that we need to be thinking about in terms of larger strategic questions about the Arctic. And so I'll take your question, and then I want everyone to take 10 minutes to meet with the two people, the one person on either side of yours. Come up with a list of the three of you, what you think the three big issues are that we need to talk about. And then let's go around and just try to get some of that stuff together. See if we have some, we, at the first day we had a lot of these discussions. Now we're getting into the kind of how do we do what we do issues. And they're all important. But George. Are we ready for more specific questions? Could be. Okay. <laughs> um, well, first of all, echo what, what, what Susan said. I, I completely agree with that. Um, and then the database idea too, sort of can we put together some more uh, dynamic databases and visualization databases that help our research but also reach out to the public, different issue. But the main question I wanted to make sure that is in there is, uh, it's a pretty specifically archaeological one, but how, how uh, can we prioritize the recording and recovery of cultural heritage that's threatened by climate change? Um, uh, because this, I think it's fair to say for a lot of the Arctic archaeologists, this is one of the biggest problems on our horizon. Uh, no, one of the biggest problems now. It's happening, and we need to figure some way to prioritize because there's no way we can save every, everything. Uh, if anything, it's going to be a tiny proportion of what's out there that we'll actually be able to record or recover. Okay, great. So it's 11.30 now. Let's take, uh, as I said, about 10, 15 minutes. Turn to the two people on either side. Shake hands with them. Say hi to who you are. <laughs> It'll be a little bit like Quaker meeting here or something. And just give, let's get a list of three or four questions that we think are really unanswered and need work.